So to get us started, I wanted to talk about your upcoming project on early modern physiology and music. So you've previously been interested in Bach and Schutz, especially the reception of their works. Um, so I was wondering how you began to be interested in sensory history or corporeal history. Is there something about the works of the composers you have specialized in that provokes questions about what you call in your work the carnal experience of music? Yes, thank you. That's a, that's a brilliant question. I think there definitely is something in those musics that I always felt I wanted to get at and talk about. And really the history of musicology has been such that especially the work of those composers has been treated in a kind of approach that sidelines anything about the embodied or carnal experience um, one might have with those musics. So the idea that what say, J.S. Bach's music is about is the theological message, it's about representation, it's about word painting. Um, and so this, this underlying sense that music acts as a kind of secondary bearer of meaning, so this group of notes means X, Y, or Z, uh, verbal content, um, and once you've decoded that meaning, you're sort of done, mm -hmm. and you've, you've dealt with the music. And Ever since my student days, I somehow had this feeling that that wasn't, that wasn't enough, that this idea that what this music was doing was representing textual content, that somehow, somehow didn't get it, what really was exciting and, 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 uh, and heartfelt about it. Um, and then I guess the other, the other side that plays into it is uh, the growing dissatisfaction I've felt over the years with uh, our listening rituals in terms of classical and concert ritual and this idea that, I mean, basically Kantian idea of the disembodied aesthetic object being put out there for a uh, ideally disembodied listener to receive as a sort of mind-to-mind -mind mm -hmm. transmission, right? So the idea that you sit in the concert hall very still, you're not really there with your body, um, you know, you open the program and I went to a concert recently and the, the front page had a big thing in a black box saying, do not cough. If you have a tickle in your throat, then don't attend this concert, right? So you're, you are an embodied, spluttering, noisy, material entity, but when you go to a concert, that sort of is meant to just proceed. And I've always found that unsatisfactory as well in relation to the kind of reports you have uh, of music from the early modern period, which are so frequently, so intensely physical about uh, the, the kinds of effects that this music might have on your heart, on your innards, on making you cry, um, just really focusing on the way in which this music could transform you physiologically and, and in, a, in a very embodied sort of way. So that's really what I wanted to get at with this project. Um, how were these bodies constituted that these kinds of effects could unfold? Um, and what might we do with that now in terms of how we listen to this music now, how we perform it? Mm. It kind of occurs to me that other than the physical in intensity of uh, these, uh, the experience of listening to these pieces, another thing that comes in is um, a kind of hesitance also to acknowledge the sensory aspects of religious experience. Um, so that subject that listens now is not only probably dispassionate or disembodied, but also secular. And it seems like particularly, I'm more uh, familiar with the work of Bach, a kind of more systematic theological interpretation is much more accepted, but a, a more post-secular, I guess, or pre-secular view of his music as triggering real religious embodied in the moment uh, experiences is something that is kind of pushed to the sidelines. In literary studies, with which I'm more familiar, we're experiencing a turn toward post-secular approaches to take seriously real religious or spiritual experiences that arise out of texts or produce texts. Do you see this happening in musicology at all? Is this something that's important to your work? Absolutely. So yes, I think uh, when we look at the reception of bass music, uh, it's it was sort of hit by this double whammy of uh, Cartesian anthropology, that you know, has sort of been the, the, the foundation of, of Western modernity's view of human nature, right? Um, and then 
I would say probably the legacy of the Reformation, which certainly in the aftermath was construed as a movement that um, sort of eliminated the sensory dimension of religious mm -hmm. experience in an attempt to focus on the word, right? Um, and that's obviously something that also has been very much reassessed in, in recent um, theological scholarship. Uh, you know, I don't know, Susan Carroll Nunn's work, um, Reformation of Ritual, uh, those kinds of things. So there, there is a sense in which Bach's music was very much understood as filled with theological significance, but not of a kind of uh, significance that was embodied. Um, it was not in some way tapping into an embodied lived experience of faith. Um, it was uh, a kind of a transmission of uh, theological doctrine um, which very much wasn't acknowledged as having a, a physical um, bodily kind of dimension. Mm -hmm. I think one way this shows up in your work is in your formulation of what you call body souls. This usually refers to, let's say, persons or subjects. Could you talk a bit about what makes body souls a good formulation for talking about the subject in the context of your work? And do you think that it makes allowances for more porous or intersubjective or kind of sensorily sensitive models of experience and consciousness? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I borrow this idea from Susan James, I should mm -hmm. say. Um, uh, I think it's 1997 book on passion and action. Uh, she introduces this as a way to uh, look outside or beyond this kind of Western modern Cartesian framework of a disembodied mind uh, somehow inhabiting a, a material body. Um, now, obviously, in uh, early modern, various early modern discourses, these kinds of dualist elements were very much present. I mean, you know, you've got the, the sort of platonic legacy of, of uh, separation of body and soul, and then obviously Christianity in itself absorbs some of those dualist elements in terms of the idea of, you know, God breathing a soul into the, into the uh, first human um, and the soul surviving um, in the afterlife and so on. Um, but I just found that in a lot of the discourses I was looking at, so not just, not just musical writings, but devotional writings, theological writings, medical writings, uh, poetry, there doesn't seem to be a sort of immediate absorption and acceptance of the Cartesian paradigm mm -hmm. across the long 17th century, say. So I, I look at uh, music up to, say, the 1740s, something like that, and still at that point you just find a lot of alternative visions to what a human being might be. So. Uh, I don't know, for instance, uh, a more kind of affective rather than dualist notion of, uh, in biblical terms, uh, a human being being made up of flesh and spirit. And if you look at the dimension of flesh, that is a way of looking at the whole human being from the perspective of being an embodied sinful agent, mortal agent mm -hmm. on earth. Or if you look at it from the perspective of spirit, a human being is a... Uh, is, is um, someone who has received the race of God and therefore transcends that mortal, sinful, embodied being that, um, that they also are. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's an aspect of rather than a dualist way of, of looking at human nature. Uh, or then there's um, a lot of evidence of a sort of Aristotelian idea of the soul as uh, distributed through the body, the sensitive soul being uh, the kind of um, element that makes the body into an active, purposive agent in the world. Uh, and okay, so and the other element that is really crucial in this um, is this idea of spirit, right? Which in early modern thinking sort of hovers between um, the realm of the soul and the body, um, and it sort of hovers on that boundary of the material and the immaterial. And so, really, the term I should have used probably is body, soul, spirit. Mm -hmm. Um, but that seemed very cumbersome. Uh, so I end up with body soul as a sort of encapsulation of some of those more holistic alternatives um, of looking at human nature, of a kind of anthropology that acknowledges the uh, entangled uh, uh, nature of what of the different constituents that might make up um, a human being. Mm -hmm. um Another 
term that I was really interested in your reading, which I think uh, you take from Le Guin, is the idea of a carnal musicology or carnalizing musicology. So I was wondering what carnal musicology might look like, um, and why do you think is it a generative way of thinking, um, and different from other recent emphases on embodied or sensory musical experience? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. It, it was obviously um, Le Guin's pioneering study was he focused specifically on, on uh, the Italian composer Boccherini really, and uh, trying to think uh, herself as a performer into the body of this composer as he sat at the cello and wrote this music. Um, and so that was really inspirational to me, uh, that idea that we could think about uh, musical creativity and musical performance as something that is fundamentally based in the body. Um, I did then want to go further in the sense that Le Guin in that study is not really interested in historicizing those bodies. Mm. Um, and I wanted to know how it was, how these bodies were constituted, uh, that music could operate within and upon them in these quite striking, intense sort of ways. Um, so, somehow pushing the idea of carnality um, into the realm of actually trying to reconstruct some of this experience of these wet, vaporous, slippery bodies that were so, uh, you know, porously open to the environment and flooded through by these kinds of uh, sonic um, stimuli, uh, that was really the, the, the impulse behind trying to find a kind of musicology that really allows us a glimpse of what it might have felt like to make music, hear music, produce music um, in, in that period. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's the religious dimension that is crucial here because you can't just think about those bodies as, as wet and um, filled with spirit. You have to somehow try and reimagine yourself inhabiting a body that was fundamentally felt to be sinful and filled with um, uh, the kind of, yeah, filled with the, the pain and weight and, and intensity of original sin, and that coloured every interaction you might have had with uh, any kind of thing that might come at you um, in, in your experience of the world. This reminds me a bit of, um, I think this was in your article where you talk about the heart figures in, in Bach scores, um, where you kind of caution against a kind of <clears throat> tendency maybe or a desire to create consumable, relivable places where, so, you know, like super tactile, like scratch and sniff scores basically, mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, because... Yeah, the, the desire certainly is there to kind of exactly replicate. And but I've seen this, um, I think in, in Wittenberg, there's a augmented reality 3D experience of Luther's house where you can go and experience Luther's Wittenberg and walk around. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to, I guess, if we're engaging with it in good faith and not saying that it's a tourist trap, it's supposed to do something. It's supposed to situate you and place you and even maybe change the way that you're oriented towards the world and you feel even you navigate your own body and your own sensory experiences. So could you talk a bit about kind of the importance of historicizing these experiences and treading the line between something that feels very novel and exciting and on the other might just be kind of false, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a really tricky one. The interesting thing is that with music, you're always treading that line, mm -hmm. right? Because you can look at the historical stuff, so you've got the scores, you've got the material objects, the instruments, you've got the historical documentation, and, and all of those things you can, you can read through and absorb and, and try and even try and inhabit some of that. Uh, but then also, we do always still want to make that music, right? And so we necessarily uh, always bring it into the present in a way that may be more or less faithful to what it might have felt in, in the 17th century. But, um, I think, you know, that is something that most of us have learned by now, that the historical performance movement um, can only be misguided if, if the idea is that somehow you, you recreate it exactly how it was. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like in, in the way that we've come to deal with music, we've sort of almost moved beyond this debate about that's un that, you know, has been unfolding in sensory history more broadly about can we recreate these experiences and should we, um, because... 
we sort of know that we can't, but we also know that our engagement now with these schools as somatic scripts mm-hmm. um, is a crucial part of trying to figure anything about anything out about um, what was going on musically. We're not going to stop performing them, and I think actually um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is talking to performers now about playing this particular um, line on the trumpet. What is it like physiologically? Because, you know, I'm a bassoonist, so there's, there's a certain way in which I have an insight into uh, wind playing as an embodied activity, uh, but for instance, in terms of string playing, I, I actually, my, my access to that is, is quite, um, it, it's, it doesn't come out of personal experience. So I, I really like talking to performers now uh, in terms of how their experience of living through those notes in performance can help us understand something more about this music. Could you talk a bit more about the concept of somatic scripts and music notation as a kind of um, polytemporal object that's both a kind of has traces of past performances and also is an instructional text for a kind of, well, I guess we've moved past this a bit, but a kind of ideal performance that is in the future or will never happen, right? Yeah, it's that's such a rich topic and, and I think we've actually only started to scratch the surface of mm-hmm what is in those schools uh, in terms of what kinds of bodily experiences they unfold. Um, so I think what I want to foreground with this idea of uh, a score being a somatic script is that um, a musical notation um, affords a range of different bodily actions of a perfor- from a performer um, and it affords a range of possible bodily reactions from um, other participants, listeners, and so on, right? Um, it, it did that then, and it still does that now. And um, in musicology, we have very sophisticated technical language to describe particular kinds of uh, groups of notes, particular kinds of uh, musical formulations, right? So take, take, I don't know, take an arpeggio. Right, so we know that it's it's a it's a particular sequence of notes. It's a it's a broken chord. It has a particular harmonic function. It it and so on and so on. Right, um, but what an arpeggio also is notated on the page it is an instruction to move your hand in a particular way mm-hmm. on the keyboard, for instance. Right, and that way of moving your hand ca- can be very habituated. Uh, in the sense that you've practiced that kind of, you know, arpeggio you're playing loads, and so it sort of comes naturally, and so it could be a kind of embodied starting point for improvisation, because it, it sort of, you know, it comes naturally, automatically, when you sit down, that's the sort of thing you might want to play, right? It could also, the way it's written, the way the chord is stretched out, it could be um, uh, challenging that sense of habituation. It could cr- uh, introduce a moment of tension because the hand has to stretch in ways that it doesn't usually isn't usually asked to. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. So so there's sort of physicality written into these gestures that I I really want to try and get at um, from a historical perspective in terms of what does it tell us about how these bodies were habituated musically. Um, and how they operate musically, um, and then also today how we might bring out that physicality that's that's sort of um, um, in inscribed in those notes. Mm-hmm. She reminds me of, uh, of a conversation I had for this series with uh, Professor Ian Cross, where he was talking about how um, when you're playing and you achieve a kind of certain kind of flow. You no longer think about, I'm going to press down on this key and it's going to make this sound. Um, your brain kind of just makes the immediate association of certain kinds of movement and touch with a certain sound and kind of blurs the mechanics in the yeah. middle. So that somatic experiences get directly and immediately associated with certain kinds of sonic experience. And so it's interesting to think back to scores and think that even as objects and as documents, they have all of this embedded in them. And a musician just looking at a score can have kind of ghosts of somatic experience that doesn't need the sound to be there in the moment immediately. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have the same kind of thing happening on the listening side, mm-hmm. where 
um, even though you're not looking at the score, you're not actually playing that arpeggio, um, you will, I mean, this is very clear in terms of, you know, what, what um, uh, I don't know, Army Cox's embodied progression uh, approach to music making, right? It, it's very clear um, what, what we know now that what's ha what happens in listening is that you do mirror, mm -hmm. right? And you do uh, live through the kind of physical engagement that a performer um, has to put in in order to produce the sounds um, in your own mind and body and so in that sense also that's that's what I mean by a score as a somatic script affording bodily reaction mm -hmm. so it's not just that um, hearing a particular piece of music might make you tap your foot or um, um, uh, produce a sort of outward physical reaction uh, it um, you will feel in your body the increase in tension that uh, a singer will have to put in, in in order to produce an ascending arpeggio um, in their own voice, for instance. And so that produces a potential physiological change within yourself. Speaking of the body, um, I wanted to talk to you a bit about the metaphor and the body. Um, one question that keeps coming out throughout our discussion sessions and throughout all the interviews is uh, the question of metaphor and the uses of metaphor and the affordances of language for describing musical experience, which is supposed to be ineffable or intangible or whatever, and then also for allowing conceptual traffic between two fields and carrying out of this interdisciplinary work. So for example, using the idea of embedded cognition or extended cognition, all these uh, kind of cognitive scientific ideas, not exactly in, in the way that they were formulated within the field, but in ways that are maybe resonant or coherent to us um, in the arts and humanities. Um, in your work, you discuss not only the physical and embodied origins of metaphorical language, but also thinking along I guess a spectrum rather than in a dualistic way, the fact that some metaphors are not entirely or just figures of speech, and that they actually refer to somatic experiences, have kind of residues still in the body. We we're just talking about the idea of strain and how strain in a vocalist might create a sense of strain in the listener, which might kind of mirror a sense of strain or yearning or something. Um, that's that's in the text of the music. So could you tell us a bit about the way that early modern medical theories, compositional practices, philosophical debates kind of come together and intersect on the issue of metaphor? And what why might early modern musical experience be a particularly rich topic for thinking through the functions of metaphorical language and its rootedness in the body? Yeah, that's brilliant. I think that's really crucial. I mean, I think it's very well known and accepted that the early moderns were very good at sort of reaching for bodily explanations for mm -hmm. kinds of things, for phenomena that that we would tend to consider to be um, of the mind um, or not not directly related to a, to a bodily experience, right? So, um, I don't know, um, the way they talk about emotions, obviously, but also the way they talk about music. Right? So their, their language is saturated with formulations that we might now describe as metaphorical, but it is hard to know where to draw that line of what, what they used as ways to describe an actual sort of experiential state um, mm -hmm. and what they were using as a sort of um, flourish of, of, of um, figural, figurative language. Right? So, for instance, when they talk about uh, the spirits and liquids in the body stagnating around the heart, um, and that causing a heartache, and that kind of heartache is associated with intense feelings of penitence and remorse, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing, right? Um, as far as I can tell, that conception of the heartache, um, a lot of those writers seem to think of it as just as real and just as painful as a toothache, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or then when writers talk about experiencing musical dissonance, and they talk about how, how extreme musical dissonances can give you a toothache. Um, again, I don't see any reason to assume that that is just metaphorical. Um, and so there's something more fundamental here, I think, um, which uh, sort of relates to the first part uh, of your question about uh, speaking across different fields. I think for me there is a fundamental question here about this assumption that only um, straight, stripped down scientific language can accurately communicate mm. 
um, or describe the real. Mm. Okay, so in terms of describing these musical experiences, a lot of times it seems to me that it's actually the metaphors that um, allow access to that realm of the real in terms of um, the experiential um, reality of hearing or playing or, or living through a piece of music like that. So it's not actually, the task is not to strip away those metaphors, but to actually um, take them by their word as um, a, a particular kind of attempt to describe something that is maybe difficult to describe in words, whether those are um, uh, literal or those are um, of a particular scientific bent, or they are very sort of poetically uh, wrapped up in in figurative language. Before we started recording, we were talking a bit about how um, we can think of all the senses kind of boiling down or having some kind of relationship to touch and haptic experience. It seems to me that for that reason, um, if we think of kind of all intersensory experiences as very much related, um, and also speech and orality and the voice, um, which produces, which is, I guess, is a big part of cognitive activity as well, mm -hmm. also being very much part of this and being very much still rooted in the idea of touch. Um, I think that suggests to me that metaphor, which is a much more porous or stickier way of speaking, um, seems better suited to talking about these experiences, which are just like another thing, but are also the other thing, but they're not. Um, it seems to me that really clean and what we might call like methodologically rigorous language does a kind of compartmentalizing that in this case is a bit unhelpful um, because it severes those those links and it severes those kind of slidings between different kinds of experience. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's that's so important. Um, if you yeah, if you think about the classic division of uh, the five senses, right, and the way in which um, uh, I don't know when you when we talk about um, music and the brain now and cognitive experience of music, it still tends to be uh, discussed um, very much in terms of uh, the one pathway, the oral input. Uh, mm -hmm. It goes in through the ear and it's and it's uh, transformed into, you know, um, electric pulses and that gets to the brain and it's decoded and then we sort of, you know, we hear music. Um, and there just is, I think, potentially so much more going on in terms of music, um, some of the dimensions that people are now becoming more attuned to in terms of music as vibrational impact on the body. But yeah, if you look at early modern experiences, for instance, talking about the way in which music could taste sweet, mm. or the idea that the heart could taste sweetness, right? Um, and you sort of think, well, that really doesn't fit with the way in which we think about um, sensory perception and the, the different sensory modalities and so on. But then, yeah, as, you know, I, I am aware, for instance, of um, uh, quite a bit of research that um, shows us that uh, taste cells are located not just in the tongue um, and the roof of the mouth and so on. They sit in all sorts of parts of the body, right? So we have taste receptors um, in the gut, um, I think in the male testicles, um, in the brain. What are they doing there? Mm -hmm. And what are we not understanding about how taste functions um, that would tell us more about why taste cells are distributed um, across across the body like that, right? So, and, and that's what I like about um, bringing these different spheres into dialogue. I really like, this is me as a historian, and you know, I know that a lot of my scientific colleagues would be very suspicious of this, mm -hmm. but I like to think of this actually as a two-way dialogue, where um, two different incomplete ways of looking at human experience can inform each other um, and bring about interesting new insight. Mm. I think that's been a really striking part of um, doing this event for me is that uh, all the people I've spoken to talk about the importance of this, the importance of interdisciplinary, let's say, generosity or humility um, or hospitability. Um, and I think that's something that we speak 
less about, I guess it's more of a practice and something that's spoken about, but um, it seems like there's a real ethics and a real etiquette um, of speaking to each other um, and welcoming each other into different different spheres. This makes me think that it's important that it's people who speak to each other rather than people who just read each other's articles because all of these things come much more intuitively when you're actually speaking to another person. Um, but yeah, this has been something that everyone I've spoken to has really advocated for, this kind of openness and kind of generosity towards mm -hmm. each other um, and this understanding that all of our knowledge is incomplete. Well, this is why we should be grateful for you for putting on this series because you're getting people talking to <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, talking about uh, this, not necessarily interdisciplinarity, but I guess rigor and uh, the way that different kinds of knowledge can complement each other. And I think that one of the reasons why early modern studies is not only hospitable to us, but also a rich ground for more flexible approaches to subjecthood and relationality. And I'm thinking here, we already mentioned distributed cognition, affect theory, exuvial approaches inspired by um, Alfred Gell's work, is that these models are in a way resonant with early modern ways of being and knowing. So we've already talked a bit about metaphor and the deeply embodied and sensory languages that um, a lot of early modern writers use to uh, describe their experiences. Um, the editors of, of a volume on distributed cognition in medieval and renaissance culture, for example, suggest that, and this is a quote, what has been perceived as superstition in humoral theories might be reconsidered as an intuitive grasp on the enmeshed nature of body and world. Um, this, I think, points to a broader in inclination to pair texts and methods not because they're directly related to each other or because they have a kind of historical or cultural correspondence directly, but because they're consonant or resonant, that they fit in ways, again, that are maybe more um, metaphorical in, in their functioning rather than a strict identity. Um, do you think that this kind of methodological resonance is a good model for interdisciplinary work? Um, do you think it's rigorous enough? What do you think uh, are its promises and limitations? Yeah, I mean, as I as I said, I, I think there's I think there's a there's a lot of promise here. I think there are. I I have, I have got this sort of sense that there are really productive, um, uh, what you call resonances to be pursued, um, if we sort of um, <laughs> just decide collectively that there are certain aspects of. The period of Western modernity that we could just sort of skip over, <laughs> um, and the, so we've now got to a point where, in leaving behind some of those fundamental assumptions about, say, um, the mind as a, a computational kind mm -hmm. of disembodied um, process, processor, uh, information processor, say, um, in in leaving behind some of those, actually there are ways in which we are circling back to certain kinds of insights, certain kinds of ways of looking at uh, human nature, human experience, that really do link up with early modern perceptions in really striking ways. And one of the things that I always try to get my students to do is to step away from this kind of um, slight uh, uh, suspicion or super sense of superiority over, mm -hmm. oh, these early modern people, they didn't quite know, they didn't quite understand that, the brain didn't work like that. Um, because yes, they didn't, and their, their ways of looking at bodies was obviously um, limited by the kind of technologies that were available then in terms of you know looking inside and so on. But they were talking about certain aspects of bodily experience that an MRI scanner now could never tell you about. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't want to say that um, we have therefore advanced so much that we can now just rely on the information we get from the MRI scanner and those other dimensions can just drop away, right? So, for instance, I don't know, um, uh, Eric Clark's um, uh, uh, approach to ideas of ecological listening, mm -hmm. right, um, and the way in which listening might be uh, a kind of um, process where um, uh, a sensory apparatus um, doesn't actually need to engage in complicated processes of decoding, uh, but um, there are ways in which it resonates with the kind of information that, that comes in. That is so uh, fundamentally true of how early models thought about music uh, coming into their bodies um, in different ways that didn't just um, mean uh, going in the ear and uh, being decoded by the brain. Um, so yeah, I, I think those synergies are 
really fascinating and I'd really like to see a lot more of the kind of things that you're doing in terms of bringing, bringing these different perspectives mm. um, together and seeing what, what emerges. Speaking of these kinds of uh, synergies, uh, you kind of refer to and bring in uh, quite a lot of um, feminist musicological theory into your work. Um, and I just was wondering how, um, how this kind of feminist writing has influenced your own thinking. And I can think of one slightly reductive way why it has to be feminist theory um, because of the kind of traditional association of women with sensory experience or, or the bodily or whatever, which was pushed to the marginalized, um, both, I guess, sort of marginalized and the female experience um, was kind of skipped over, perhaps because it was um, seen to be more sensuous and more bodily rooted uh, than the male experience. So yeah, I was, but I'm, I'm sure that this is not all of it. So um, I was wondering what this attention to feminist perspectives has uh, contributed to your own work. Yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely fundamental to my work in terms of um, the very, very, in very basic ways, in terms of the foregrounding of the constructed nature of bodies, mm -hmm. right? Uh, just the thinking outside the category of the body, right? And so um, I think we, we, we are all, in, in a way, anyone who's thinking historically or culturally about bodies is, is indebted to to that recognition right mm -hmm. um, and then and then I don't know there's the, you know there's there's lots of different um, strands I could I could pick up here but I guess one one thing I would say is um, Elizabeth Gross's work um, volatile bodies um, the idea that uh, bodies are these strange entities that sort of hover on the threshold of different binary pairs I've talked quite a bit about finding different ways of um, uh, stepping outside of a sort of dualist uh, frame, mm -hmm. frame of mind. Um, so her idea that, that bodies actually sort of uh, sit um, at, the, at the meeting point of, of two opposites, or they, they occupy a sort of liminal space, um, a threshold space between two domains, that, that kind of thing. I, I, find that, I find that really fascinating, and it's really fundamental to the way in which I, you know, in, in the book, I... I basically end up finding that the bodies I look at are neither fully constructed nor fully natural. Mm -hmm. um, music is neither a, a fully disembodied aesthetic object nor just material vibration. Um, we talked about metaphor um, and the literal as a spectrum um, or the, dual, the dualism of body and soul, of body and mind is broken up by this interference of spirits and of, of distributed souls and so on. So, so somehow bodies allow you a way of thinking that maybe gradually you start moving away from these um, set um, binaries and oppositions and acknowledge more of the enmeshed nature of, of mm. these different aspects. This is just, I feel like this is just so rich because I think of like someone like Lakoff and Johnson's work um, in talking about how the origin of, of maybe all metaphors is the idea of the body as container and the uh, idea of inside and outside and thinking of, I guess, historically the female body, but you could say bo different kinds of bodies as porous and leaky and mm -hmm. on the edge, mm -hmm. not only um, enriches our ideas of embodied experience, but then starts to deform and transform all of our metaphorical thinking, mm -hmm. I think, in ways that are really interesting. One of the things, again, that I've um, kept coming back to in the uh, course of this series has been the idea of deformation. Um, so there's a really fascinating article by Alex Freer about uh, poetics and psychoanalysis, and where he basically makes the suggestion that we can't really do purely literary analysis of psychoanalytic writing, let's say, mm -hmm. or ideas, and we can't do purely psychoanalytical um, readings of literary texts, but that in their encounter, both of these discourses get deformed, and it's in that deformation that we might find room to think mm -hmm. in new ways. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the things that it seems, at least, that feminist theory does to a lot of our thinking is that it deforms and kind of makes room for and makes liquid a lot of our hard categories. Just to uh, 
close off, I think you mentioned that you're a bassoonist and I just was wondering how your work on the physiology project and how your work in general and the way that your research questions on the kind of scholarly, writerly side of things uh, have developed, how have they shaped your own experience of and encounters with Baroque music, uh, both as a listener and as a performer? Do you feel now kind of experientially more alert or more proximate to the musical experiences of early modern listeners and performers? Yeah, I have this real problem that I, I, I can't sit still at concerts anymore. I get really frustrated with... Um, and I, so, and, okay, so, so this is good because we're not talking here about reconstructing historical experience. Because right. as far as we can tell, I mean, there was, you know, I don't know, people listening in church, there was commotion in church and so on, but it wasn't that people were um, wildly dancing along while the cantata was playing, right? So the fact that I feel like I want to move about <laughs> uh, when, I, when I listen to music now, that's not um, re-inhabiting an early 18th century body in church or anything. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a way in which um, the research I've done and the stuff I've thought about has served its purpose of inviting me to uh, be open to different kinds of experiences in engaging with this music, right? So, um, and that's really what I hope the project can be. It can be a sort of invitation to um, approach this music differently, to, to play it differently. I've talked quite a bit to performers. I've, I've done some workshops with performers. It's really interesting, that sort of um, meeting of their experiences with some of the stuff I've been thinking about. Um, and more generally for, for listeners um, to just try out different ways of listening with a kind of body, mind, soul that isn't quite your own mm -hmm. and see what happens. Mm -hmm.